Hello and welcome to After Scientology Straight Up and Vertical, the weekly show where Tony Ortega and I get together and we go over the events in Scientology as reported on Tony's Substack. Hey, Tony, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back, Chris. Yeah, this is fun. I really got to say, uh, I enjoy this part of my week every week, just so you know. <laughs> we get to talking about some great stuff. And this week was actually quite, there was some good stuff that happened this week in this world. I wanted to start with, you uh, You covered Jeff Levine Levin's story of having a film made about his experience, Broken Brothers Broken, and being oh, released at a film festival. What was the whole, what's the whole story here? Well, that's, I mean, that's been coming for a while. Um, Jeff, uh, Jeff Levin and Robbie Levin have a wonderful Scientology story. They were very tight and they were on a band that had a 1968 hit record and then joined the Sea Org. Not all the members uh, joined, but most of them did. And we're working with, um, uh, at the early Hollywood Celebrity Center when it was first started, 1969 or whatever. So it kind of ruined their whole rock and roll careers. And eventually, uh, Robbie Levin left in the 80s, and Jeff stayed behind. And, you know, years and years and years, he was in Scientology. But he was also still a success as a musician. He did a lot of soundtracks for TV commercials and films. Uh, You know, he worked with Apple to help create the marketing of the Macintosh and everything. I mean, he did some really amazing stuff while he was still associated with Scientology, but eventually it was, it was just getting him down. And he describes a period when he was in terrible depression and might have died. I mean, that was the point where people were checking on him because he just wasn't taking care of himself and he was becoming a hermit and all that. And then he said, he just happened to land on a story I had written for the village voice in 2011 about Tommy Davis, who he knew and he couldn't help himself. He was curious about it. He read that and he was fascinated by it. And he was fascinated that this Tony Ortega guy at the Village Voice seemed to know a lot about Tommy Davis and Scientology. And wow, this is interesting. So he just started reading my pieces and uh, it it helped him, he said, you know, get out of there. And he eventually reached out to me. It's in the movie. It's fun. It, it, and he... um. We did, they did film me and I'm a little part of their movie where he reached out to me and behind the scenes was giving me information about the Celebrity Center and then started showing up in my comment section with a pseudonym. And I was like, oh, be careful, guy. They're going to figure out who you are. You know, really fun stuff that they put in the movie. But eventually it led him to leave Scientology, gave him the courage to leave, reunite with his brother. And they're even, you know, they even made a new album uh, 50 years after their first hit. So it's a wonderful story. They decided that they wanted to make a movie about it. It, it. The very first premiere was in San Jose, where they're from, in California. And then I think it also had a Los Angeles premiere. Now they're having their New York premiere at this really great independent film festival. And he asked me if I would be there since I'm in New York. I said, sure. And then the thing that really surprised me is he asked, he told me, he says, I'm going to ask Mike Rinder if he'll be there. I thought, yes, yeah, sure, right. Mike Rinder is going to come up from Florida for your movie, but he's doing it. I'm so happy. So this Sunday, I not only get to be with Jeff Levin at the New York premiere of his movie, and I haven't seen the latest version of it. I've seen some previous versions. Yeah. Um, not only do I get to see the movie and see Jeff, but I get to see Mike Rinder Sunday. I'm really excited about that. You know, he and I have both gone through this. This is our cancer year, you know, and uh, not mine wasn't nearly as bad as his, but we've both been through some surgeries and stuff. And uh, I, well, I don't know exactly what his treatments were, but basically we've come out the other side and I just feel closer to him than ever. And I'm really looking forward to seeing him. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great story on so many levels. Um, you know, uh, even even the, even the meeting up with Mike part, uh, but and Jeff's film brought me to tears. I was absolutely floored by that movie, and I knew what was coming, and it still hit me right in the feels. Um, which means it's a you know it's an impactful movie. Um, and he's prominent, by the way. There's there are things that Jeff contributed to in Scientology. He's not just another ex guy. The Dianetics jingle, the do 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 that's him. Right. He came up with that. 
And that's just as much part of that commercial as the text and the formatting and everything that that Hawkins came up with. He is right. a you know, and there are other Scientology properties ex members are familiar with that he scored or did work for. Um, so he's been a prominent part of that, and his whole recovery story is intense. Um, they're, they're a remarkable couple of guys. Not only was Jeff involved with all these different uh, projects that you've probably heard of or didn't know he was involved in, but Robbie invented spinning. They made they made a separate documentary about that, that it was Robbie who came up with the idea of setting up a bunch of stationary bikes and having everybody ride together and you know in unison and all that was a that was a robbie levin idea um and you know they're they're remarkable guys and it, it was it's just terrible that they spent so many years apart because of scientology and then of course jeff paid the ultimate price because when he finally did leave scientology and reunite with his brother then he lost his kids who disconnected from him so just a really really sad part of that whole story Big time. Very much big time. I want to highlight one other thing that you talked about there, though, and this is from me and from so many out there, is Jeff's connection to your blog, to your work, leading to him coming out. OK, and and uh, and I know that's isn't why you brought this up, but I'm going to say because that's my story, too. Right. So many of us. That's how we started getting those seeds uh, planted is through your work. So, um, so it's a it's a good story, and uh, and it's a and it's a story worth telling. Um, now, on moving on to another very interesting and probably still developing story, you did a podcast with uh, Alex about this thing with the mayor of East Grinstead. What is this about? Yeah, you know, Alex did such a good job with his protests at the IAS gala, and uh, there's still stuff you know, falling out from that. One of the things he, he followed up on was that on Sunday uh, over that three day event, they do a charity concert and, you know, they have the local, the, the, this is the idea where they're supposed to invite some locals from East Grinstead to come in and enjoy this concert. And then they give some charity to some local cause. Mm. And in this case, they gave a 50,000 pound check to the mayor of East Grandstead and his charity, which is the Victoria Hospital. And um, uh, Alex decided to follow up on that. And it turns out that this, you know, at some point uh, the mayor was also going to help uh, light the Christmas fireworks at the, I mean, Christmas lights mm. with fireworks at mm. St. Hill. And one of the locals was asking him about that. You know, you're at the charity concert. You're helping them with the Christmas lights. Why are you so involved with Scientology? And on Twitter, he had said, because Scientology is such a large part of our town. And Alex did look at the math. He's like, are you kidding me? There's In the last census, the number of Scientologists in East Grinstead was less than two-tenths of one percent. So I love the fact that he followed up on that and, mm -hmm. and he's questioning why this mayor is, is doing so much for Scientology. And I think, you know, we talked about that and, and he found that um, earlier this year, the mayor got to meet Tom Cruise at a Mission Impossible premiere. I mean, you know, this, I mean, it's just classic safe pointing by Scientology and I think his story is breaking out, you know, breaking some other stuff loose. And I have a feeling we're going to see some other updates from him. So I was just, I just thought it'd be fun to talk to him about that. And, and it's always, you know, fun to talk to him. So. Absolutely. It's, a, I mean, of all the places that you would be least surprised to find out that Scientology has been engaged in what they call PR area control. Right. Okay. Let's be clear. This is control. Uh, they even call it that. That's what they've been doing. And East Grinstead would be, of course, you know, the place you'd be least surprised about that, maybe outside of Clearwater, let's say. Um, and here it is, right? And here's and and there's even the photo op with with Tom Cruise. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, there it is. Yeah. And, you know, because Tom Cruise isn't going to just stand there in a line with the mayor of East Grinstead. If this is an important thing for Scientology, Tom Cruise is going to sit down and talk to him and, and you know, and do all this stay all this one on one with him. And he and this mayor of this little town in England is going to feel like the most important person in the world. Exactly. You know, that that stuff matters. 
uh, and and here we are. So yeah, I very much look forward to seeing further developments with that. I saw, I think it was yesterday, the mayor had actually blocked Alex on Twitter as a public <laughs> official. Like, whoa, dude, you know? So he's been getting it from a few quarters. Um, okay, now other good news this week, dropping Mitch Brisker's book is now out there. What's this story? Right, so he let me know that he was gonna put it on Amazon on Black Friday. And uh, he had sent it to me uh, early because he, he had asked me for a blurb. So I read it, I don't know, several weeks ago. I thought it was great. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it starts out and he says, I know you want to hear about the Scientology, but first I got to tell you about where I'm from. He starts telling you about Hollywood. And I was kind of like, mm, I don't know, dude. I would have jumped right in the middle and then maybe come back later. Right. Uh, but, but I found it really intriguing. He yeah. did have a very interesting upbringing. He was around some really interesting people. And he, you know, he kind of um, was ahead of his time in filmmaking. He he was like in the very first class of, of Cal Arts when it was being founded. Yeah. And so he got a real good film education. And um, but at the same time, he was also uh, in this Hollywood crowd that was using a lot of drugs. And he ended up with a heroin, heroin addiction. Right. And he talked about how, you know, um, a friend said, check out Scientology to help you with that. And and he did say that they were they did seem really concerned about him and were very helpful and helped him dry out. And so he felt obligated. He felt like, you know, these people really care about me. I should, you know, not just dismiss them. And so he then ended up becoming their film director. I mean, over, you know, he describes how it kind of, you know, happened over time. But eventually that's what he was. He was he was Scientology's film director. And it was a very unique situation because he was working with all these Sea Org members in very sensitive Sea Org, you know, mid, you know, compounds and stuff, but he wasn't a Sea Org member himself. So he kind of was in this odd situation where he could see that cloistered world they were all in, but he wasn't part of it. And he also had a unique relationship with Dave Miscavige. I actually appreciated this. I know some people didn't like the way I described it, but, um, you know, he could see that Miscavige was a micromanager and a demanding guy, tyrant like everybody else. But he was also at times, you know, the benefactor of Miscavige kind of protecting him. And, you know, there were some other Sea Org members that were kind of trying to do him in and, and Dave made sure he was protected, you know. So he he saw a side of Miscavige that he was actually fun to work with and he could be a fun guy to be around. And I think, you know, that's probably true. I mean, Miscavige is probably not a tyrant monster 24 hours a day. And if there are probably certain people that he does allow them to see a more casual side of him. And that was Mitch Frisker was one of those people. But he also was on, you know, the plane that they took to uh, England and, uh, you know, Dave was back in the cabin with Lou all night. So and he and I did that story, but, you know, several weeks ago. I'm not griping about this, but I just I do want to point out that Mitch, you know, Mitch came out on Janice and Mark's uh, YouTube channel weeks, weeks ago. He did a lot of YouTube and then he and I did this really cool story about you know, Dave and Lou in the cabin in the private plane, Tom Cruise's private plane going to England. He was, Mitch was sitting up in front with, uh, in the in the main cabin with Diana Hubbard of all people. And the, you know, the, he said, look, even, even though he can't say definitively what Dave and Lou were doing back there all night, it was still a violation of Sea Org rules for Dave to be in that room with that woman who was not his wife all night long. So that was a very fun story that he and I did together to show that, look, this might help explain why Shelly is kept up in the, you know, the mountainous uh, compound. So then, uh, I don't know, a week or so ago, Daily Mail came out with a big story. Mitch Brisker speaking out for the first time and tells the airplane story. And I'm like, oh, yeah, of course. Uh, OK, of course. Daily Mail, I got you, whatever. But yeah. no, that was a good piece they did. And it, and it was great. It's good that he's getting this kind of attention. He is in a unique situation and he tells the story well. It's a fun book to read. Um, you know, like I can't help enjoying reading about how, you know, uh, oh, the L. Ron Hubbard life exhibition on Hollywood Boulevard was just not coming together. And it's like, Mitch, you got two weeks, fix it. You know, and he was the guy. Because I have to tell you, Chris, you know, all these years, I've seen Scientology's look in its videos, 
-hmm. the look it produces in its um, you know facilities. And yeah, David Miscavige is running everything, but he's got to have people there producing some of that. And I've always wondered yeah. who comes up with it. It's Mitch Brisker. Yeah. So that's fun. That's fun to talk to the guy who actually was responsible for producing the look and feel of Scientology. And now he's talking about it. Now he's talking about how he regrets helping this group. And uh, so I think you'll find it a really fascinating book. I really enjoyed it. Absolutely. I um I got to read uh literally the first manuscript and give feedback and work with him on it. And I I said the same stuff about the LA stuff too. I was like, really? You're gonna lead with this? But it was great. It's fine. You know, it's 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 a good book and it definitely does set it up well because Mitch is not your average run of mill guy. He had an interesting right. life right from the get-go and 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 he's really brutally honest about it too. Uh, you know, growing up in the 70s and all of that. And I wanted to also point out. For anybody who goes, oh, well, you know, they helped him get off what heroin. What was this? No, 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 no. This was Yvonne Gench. This isn't the Church of Scientology. This was the Celebrity Center. And the Celebrity Center was Yvonne Gench's little baby. And you've, and this is a person who stands out in the sort of Scientology history books as a singularly acceptive exception to the Sea Org awfulness. She was legendary for being an actual caring, compassionate person to everyone who ever met her, uh, except her kids, but we won't go there today, um, you know, because they had the Scientology in her life and it was awful. But Yvonne was just somebody who stood out. And so she's the one who set the tone for that place where Mitch was able to find some help. And, and of course, he got sucked in. And once he was in, he got the full awful like like, like all of us did. Uh, but he got to do it right under David Miscavige for so many years, which was just the source of so many fascinating stories that man has told. So his book is really quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Now we have a legal update. Uh, a couple of them actually on that, on what was up with the Jane Doe lawsuit. Well, this was the Bixler lawsuit. Bixler, um, yeah. This was the lawsuit by the, the three Jane Doe's and a fourth woman and Jane Doe three's husband. Um, this is the lawsuit that was filed in 2019 um, before Danny had even been charged criminally. Uh, it's it's suing Danny and the church for what the women say is harassment they've been through mm -hmm. since they came forward. That lawsuit was put on hold while Danny's criminal case was proceeding. Once Danny was sentenced to 30 years to life in prison, then the civil suit got going again, and Scientology immediately filed these motion to strike and anti-slap motions against it, wanting a large part of the lawsuit to be removed. And uh, their reasoning was, look, that yeah, at one point, this lawsuit was forced into um, Scientology arbitration. An appeals court re uh, reversed that ruling, saying, no, these women are really complaining about things that happened to them after they left the church of Scientology. So you can't hold them to contracts they signed while they were in the church of Scientology. So Scientology is now saying, Oh, if that's the case, then there shouldn't be anything in this lawsuit about their period in Scientology. And their attorneys are saying, wait a minute, that stuff is in there to help you understand why they're doing what they're doing today. Right. Um, so, but, and then when it manifested itself in a hearing this week, what they argued about, the other thing they wanted removed was any, they want, the Scientology wanted anything to do with the internal policies and in particular, fair game, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't like that the lawsuit talks about how the reason that these women are being harassed is it's a legacy of L. Ron Hubbard's fair game policy. And they want all that removed. And their argument is nothing, there should be nothing about a church's internal policies uh, in a civil lawsuit. And also fair game doesn't exist anymore. So um, we did have a, somebody there taking notes while the hearing was going on. And, and it was in the morning, in the morning, the judge just wanted to talk about it. He said, I don't have a ruling yet. I just want to talk about this. And he asked this killer question, Chris, I wish I had been there to hear this. He said to the Scientology's attorneys that, you know, one of the cases that gets always gets brought up in this litigation is Lawrence Wollersheim's case from the 80s. Yeah. And the judge brought that up. Judge Upinder Cholera brought that up and said, you know, the Scientology attorneys in Wollersheim were defending the fair game policy. You today are saying it's a fiction. <laughs> 
Oh, nailed it. Nailed it. Oh, I wish I'd been oh. there to see that, you know. Um, oh. You know, so at so in the morning, in the morning, there was this great discussion of fair game, and the judge seemed on top of things and everything was great. Well, that was the day before Thanksgiving. Mm. The morning of Thanksgiving, I got up real early. I was just going to put up a Thanksgiving type post. And I thought, you know what? I better check the doc. It's just in case. And it turns out on the afternoon, that same afternoon, after that interesting discussion about fair game, the judge did issue a ruling. Now, he did not grant Scientology what they wanted as far as taking out all that language about when they were in Scientology, taking out the language about fair game. But what he did take out were their... Um, pleadings for exemplary charges and treble damages. I mean, exemplary damages and treble damages. Hmm. And I, you know, it, it was it was six o'clock in the morning on third on Thanksgiving morning. I just I don't know what this means. I'm just going to put it out there and we'll figure it out later. Yep. So I just went ahead and put it out, and then I talked to my attorney Scott, and he was saying, "Yeah, this isn't great for the plaintiffs. I mean, it's it's basically taking out." Um, uh, so that if there was a trial and Scientology lost, there would be less of a penalty than there was before. Mm. And if that's the case, then if they want to settle this case, Scientology probably doesn't have to pay as much as they would otherwise. Mm. Now, you know, I want to talk to some other attorneys, see how they feel about it, because, uh, you know, on the surface, it looks like the judge has taken some of the teeth out of this lawsuit against Scientology. Mm. and uh so mm. Mm. Is, and that's after he seemed to be so savvy in the morning yeah. about fair game so mm. i don't know chris you know this is a thing this is like oh these lawsuits they just well, this is what we were talking about even last week is it's a bit of a coin toss it's the judge's interpretation of the laws and the judge's decisions right and we're not talking criminal we're talking civil so it's a whole different set of rules than what you might imagine from watching law and order you know it's just as different um yeah you gotta wonder about that kind of thing damn er, er. um at least he knows i, mean, I, I may hear from some attorneys that it really doesn't hurt the lawsuit and everything's fine but um it just it just looked uh, like he had uh, taken out some of the things about the lawsuit that really would have hurt Scientology in the pocketbook. So, what do we is this an appealable decision? I don't know yet. Okay. And is this subject to if they're going to do a new complaint filing? Isn't there, isn't there some new thing coming? Right. There's anyway? a new complaint coming in. Exactly. There's a new complaint coming anyway. So the, uh, that'll be one of the first things I look for, see if they try to get those treble damages right. back, in back in there. In. <laughs> <laughs> but we have a new filing, Judge. Here you go. <laughs> I'll, look, I'll look for that. We'll see. Yeah, we'll have to see what happens with that. I, I mean, I hate to jump to too many conclusions. I just right. I just was surprised that he sounded so savvy in the morning, and then in the afternoon he kind of did some things that seemed to help Scientology. So we'll see. Right. I don't know. It's early. All right. Well, uh, it is. It is still early. And since we know we have an amended complaint coming, let's see what happens. Right. Um, okay. And finally, we have some interesting end-of-the-year news coming up for Scientology with what looks like a reinstitution of their New Year's event with David Miscavige possibly on stage. What are we looking at with this? Well, so, you know, uh, after the pandemic, um, Dave basically uh, installed himself in Clearwater, started going to Friday night graduations, and then was holding their their traditional events like LRH birthday and uh, New Year's Eve at the Fort Harrison Hotel. Mm-hmm. Uh and so that's what they've had to do for a few years. Now they announced they're going to do the IAS back in England. So it's kind of like, okay, they're going to try to get their traditions going again, which is in October or November, you go over to England and put up the big tent and have the IAS gala. Well, they did that. Tom Cruise was there. Jenna Elfman was there. And, uh, you know, I'm sure from the Scientologist perspective, it was a huge success. Well, then on the then traditionally, the next thing, big thing on the calendar, what they would do is around the middle of December, they would ask people to come to the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles, pretend it's New Year's Eve, put on a big event and taped and count down to midnight 
and then show that video on New Year's Eve, December 31st, in all the orgs around the world. That's what they would traditionally do. Well, they just restored the tradition in England. Now I get this flyer passed forwarded to me from somebody in LA saying, look, they're inviting everybody to come to LA in the middle of December. But it doesn't mention the shrine. It doesn't mention taping a New Year's event. Mm. So I was I was asking people, what do you think? You know, it's, and, and the other thing that was odd about that flyer, Chris, was they were referring to Los Angeles as the Scientology capital of the world. I don't remember them doing that before. And it's it's interesting timing because I've been saying for several years that the that the Scientology you know, gravity center of gravity has been moving from LA to mm -hmm. Clearwater, Florida. That's right. And That's so right. now they're calling LA the Scientology capital of the world. That's I don't know about that. Well, that no, yeah, that's interesting to me. I can speak to a couple things on this. One, um, numbers wise, I believe LA is the largest concentration of Scientologists in the world. Right. When I was right. in, that was true. Clearwater right. was, you know, kind of there. I think it was second. Um, interestingly, the Portland area and Oregon was the third and the Seattle and the Bay area. Uh, and it was a competition for third and fourth between Portland area and the Bay area for highest concentrations of Scientologists in the world. Everywhere else oh, wow. Wow. goes down from there. Right. Uh, I mean, UK, there's hardly anybody there, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so Scientology capital of the world is not, is not the first time I've heard this phrase, right? We used to okay. talk about this in PAC all the time. Okay. Right. And so numbers wise that, you know, that's true. Um, but you're absolutely right. And perception wise, it has appeared that Clearwater has become the center of the Scientology universe because that's where Miscavige has been hanging for so long. So maybe now they're trying to do what they would refer to as a um, as a sort of an affluence repair action where it's we're going to get back in the earlier successful actions what worked before whatever caused the statistic to go up before will cause it to go up again and right. so if holding events at the shrine or doing la concentrated stuff maybe well, that's like I said, that that flyer that i got was talking about everyone coming to la yeah calling la the scientology capital world the other thing it was asked is asking scientologists to come and tour Scientology facilities. That's another thing I haven't really seen them do before. Yeah, that's where they list them all and say, come on by the, you know, you know, and it's weird. But then a couple of days later, yeah. one of my sources was specifically invited by a, you know, somebody in Scientology mm -hmm. to come to the shrine Saturday night, December 16th, to tape the news event. There we go. So yeah. I think I think they are, you know, they resurrected the IAS thing. Yeah. I think they're resurrecting the LA thing. And of course, then the question becomes, is Dave going to be there? And, you know, Mike had told me that um, it made sense that he, that his first uh, sort of, you know, uh, thing that he was restoring is the IES because the security can be super tight there. He can yep. fly into a private airport, airport, get taken right to St. Hill. He said the shrine wasn't as secure. So, Hey, he's going to try it out and see if he can get into the shrine, but you were you were telling me you think that he can have good security there. I do, I do. I've I now of course Mike shares this with me. We've both been behind the stage. We've both been to the green room. We've both seen everything behind the curtains, literally. Um, but knowing what I know about that, I don't see it as a problem at all. Miscavige can very easily control showing up to a very exact place, getting out of his vehicle, taking, you know, being escorted or having people, you know, uh, wall off his, you know, anybody having access to him, going up a ramp, going onto the stage. It could be that fast. Um, there's really not much behind the shrine stage. <laughs> So okay, okay. it wouldn't be hard at all, as far as I'm concerned. I don't think it's the security nightmare people might think it is. Now, if he wants to go glad hand or do, you know, whale appreciation night, you know, after the speaking event, that too can be controlled. He can, there's an upstairs area, which can be a uh, wall, you know, uh, th that has stairways going up to them from the, from the after event space. They can control that. It's not hard. A few guys can do it. And he can meet and greet whoever they let up there, and they are very controlled about that. So it's all I'm saying is it's possible to do. I'm not saying they're going to do it, right. but yeah. it's not the biggest concern.
Well, it sounds like he's going to do it. And so he's yeah. got the IAS going again. He'll get the New Year's event at the Shrine going again. And um, so I'm sure Scientologists, you know, inside are telling themselves, look, COB's got everything back to the way it was. So they're probably very happy about it. That's exactly right. Because it because the community thing is a big deal uh, for a lot of the LA area Scientologists. And these events are where they they meet and greet. This is where they get together. This is it's a big thing. And it's and the shrine holds, I think, 54 hundred. It's a like much that. bigger capacity than any of the other uh, like mm -hmm. Ruth Eckerd Hall or the tent in St. Hill, which Alex, by the way, has confirmed only holds maybe 3000 at the most based on the dimensions of the tent and then when we saw photos of the of the seats inside it was only like a thousand but nothing like the six or seven thousand they claim but the shrine legitimately holds between five and six thousand people correct and so you it makes you wonder what is dave going to do to make it look like it's full because i think they'd have a real hard time filling that up right now I believe that that is true, too. And I will bet you if we ever see full-blown pictures of the whole hall, we will see blackened out areas on the top kind of thing. Because they can control access again, right? This That was literally my job. So that's why I know so much about this stuff is, is moving bodies around in that building was literally my task for years uh running those events so um so they can very they can control that stuff it was never as under control as we wanted it to be though <laughs> <laughs> so so we'll see we'll see how this works out uh and those were the stories for this week uh as i'm always want to do as we move into well, december here I mean, the big thing this week is you know if you're in the new york area please come out and see jeff and robbie's movie i think you'll really enjoy it you'll get to see mike and me and maybe uh we can answer some of your questions so please come on out awesome 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 okay guys well that is our show for this week i hope this was informative entertaining and educational as always and i hope you will subscribe to tony's Substack. you can see the address right there uh, below his name uh you can get daily notifications of those articles like i do and that's what keeps you in the loop on what's happening every single day in scientology all right tony thanks a lot See you later.